So tonight, I, I'd like to continue this journey of how we can live forever uh, using circadian medicine, which is Nobel Prize winning science, which um, uh, soon there will be medical doctors specializing in circadian medicine. So there'll be medical doctors telling you to eat a big lunch, have a light supper, um, doing all the things that most of us know to be true. And, I, and what I want to do tonight is share with you some of the basics about how to live a seasonal uh, routine, uh, a daily routine in sync with the natural cycles from an Ayurvedic perspective, but also talk about the modern science that would back that up. It's kind of really interesting, I think, about the science. In one study, um, I just want to share with you one little sort of scary study about how delicate the circadian rhythms are. They took a bunch of uh, Westerners and they went, took them on a plane ride and they shipped them to Israel and then back. And like, they got there and they turned around and came right back. And they measured the microbes inside of their gut. And the microbes shifted dramatically just from that circadian stress of going across so many time zones so quickly um, to the point where their bugs sort of began to shift to become more diabetic and more obese-like microbes in their gut. Um, in the same study, they took mice and they severed their superchiasmatic nuclei in their brain, which, is, which regulates the circadian clock, and they severed that. And in short order, the mice sort of lost their circadian rhythms. They started eating in the daytime and sleeping at night and eating incessantly at any time of the day. And in short order, their microbes shifted to become sort of like the people who took that transatlantic trip, more like obese and, and diabetic uh, microbes in their gut. Then they took the bugs out of the people who came back from that transatlantic trip and they, they, they put them into healthy mice. And uh, again, in short order, the mice, uh, healthy mice started actually seeing microbes that were more like obese and diabetic uh, microbes. And they started eating at, during the daytime and eating incessantly and sort of threw off their circadian clock. Um, the circadian clock is very delicate, but it's also very resilient. And if you live a life in sync with the natural cycles, you can have a ton of resiliency and, and not be kind of hammered by the lifestyle that we live here in the West. And that's what I want to share with you tonight, is how we can kind of create that resiliency. Um, uh, I wrote a book back in the year 2000 uh, called The Three Season Diet, and nobody read it, I think because everybody thought there were four seasons, right? So I think that might have been why. Uh, I'm not sure. But anyway, nobody read it, so whatever. It, and so then I read a study. Um, it was in a book called The Forest on the Scene where this botanist took a, a square meter of earth and he watched it for a year. And anything that crawled onto his little meter of earth, he wrote about it and talked about it and from a circadian rhythm perspective. And uh, a deer wandered onto his little patch of earth one day, and he started talking about deer. And he said that deer have unique microbes for digesting bark in the winter, and which is very dense. Um, and they have completely different microbes for digesting leaves in the summer. And the study went that if they actually gave the deer the bark in the summer where they had the wrong microbes, not strong enough microbes to digest the bark in the summer, it caused such a level of indigestion it could kill the deer. And I was like, wait a minute. Deer die when they eat out of season? What about us? Do we get to just eat whatever we want, whenever we want, completely out of season? Does it make any difference to us at all? And that sort of blew my mind. And, and that was what my three season diet book was actually about. Um, so I took the book and I chopped it up into monthly packets and we actually published a monthly grocery list, superfood list and recipe list for every month of the year for free. It's called the Three Season Diet Challenge. And the reason why there's three seasons is because there's actually three harvests that we interact with nature from. There's a spring harvest that we all know about. There's a summer harvest and there's a fall harvest for winter eating. So we interact with three seasons. One season is dormant. Nature takes a rest, right? Everybody needs a rest. The whole thing is based on cycles of rest and activity. And nature is exactly the same way. Uh, so, so, so what does that look like? We, we, we know that in the soil, the bugs 
change dramatically from one season to the next. There's massive microbial surges that take place as we speak right now in the springtime. And there's completely different bugs that happen in the summer and completely different bugs that happen in the soils in the winter. When you pull a root or a food out of the ground, you're inoculating your gut bugs for this year's version of the seasonal bugs. Bugs in the winter to boost immunity, bugs in the spring to decongest you, and bugs in the summer to dissipate heat for you. Um, it's uh, interesting that the, the, the um, the Hadza tribe, it was a study done in Stanford University, and they found that the, the Hadza, which is one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer tribes, they measured their, their gut bugs, and they found uh, a couple of things. So the first study, they, they went, and they found that, um, that the men had different microbes in their guts than the women and children did. And it didn't really make any sense, and it sort of went something like this, where the men would wake up in the morning and go, uh, honey, we're going uh, hunting. The boys and I are going to go hunting today. And they would go off and hunt. they go, okay, happy hunting. And they would go off and they would hunt and they would come back and they go, how did it go? And they go, oh, well, we were persistent, hunted all day long. We're so exhausted, but it got away. And they came back empty handed and the mothers and the children were like, it's okay. We've been gathering all day long. We have nuts and tubers and we cook dinner. Go wash up and have some dinner. And they would, and next morning they come back, we're going hunting, and the boys and I are going hunting this morning, and they go, happy hunting. Anyway, when they took the microbiome of the men and the women, it was completely different. The men had microbes for meat and high-protein diets of meat, and the women had microbiomes that could digest grains and nuts and tubers and seeds. So the men... I guess they did like satellite photography imagery and they found that the men, when they would go off on their happy hunting party and they came back empty handed every day, they actually didn't, they did come back empty handed but they had these like barbecue situations going all by themselves, dancing around, having a big party, they come back, man, it's been a hard day. We came back empty handed, you know, maybe tomorrow. And anyway, I thought that was really interesting. And I wondered if the Stanford study, if the research actually told the, the, the Hadza tribe what they found. I think that would be a really bad idea. Otherwise, the next study probably never would have happened. They were like, you guys get the hell out of here. because There's no way we're letting you back here because you know too much. Um, and what they found was that the gut bugs dramatically did, not only did the men and the women have different bugs, but they did not dramatically shifted from season to season to season to season. And that's exactly what should happen inside of us. They found now, new studies have found that our gut bugs change dramatically to have more carbohydrate-based foods in the summer and more proteins and fats in the winter. And that's exactly what happens. The squirrels eat nuts and seeds in the winter, a higher fat, more insulating, high-protein fat diet in the, in the wintertime and in the summertime when all the, when all the grains and, and nuts and seeds and, and fruits and vegetables, all of which are very high in carbohydrate, are harvested in the summer, and we have gut bugs to dramatically, that dramatically shift to support that seasonal change. They also found that the microbial diversity, which is how many different kinds of bugs that you have inside of you, changed dramatically from one season to the next. And they found that the, the microbial, microbial diversity is interestingly greater in the wintertime and less great or less diverse in the summertime. And in the winter, is when you actually need more microbial diversity because that's when you need a really strong immune system against colds and flus and things like that. In the summer, you don't need such a strong immune response. So that's what they think is happening there where the microbes were much more diverse in the wintertime, which is really important. In Ayurvedic medicine, they say that the digestive system is significantly stronger in the winter as opposed to the summer. And you need a stronger digestive system in the winter. Your agni needs to be stronger to keep you warm in the winter. It has to break down the bark like the deer had. They had different microbes to break down the harder to digest foods, the more dense foods. While in the summertime, the foods are cooked on the vine. And you can eat those foods without, and you don't have to heat them up inside of you because it's hot outside. And one of the reasons why we're here and the Neanderthals aren't here is because we were the persistence hunters. We were the ones who evolved to be able to dissipate heat better. And one of the ways we did that was by having 
foods that were in season and eating foods that were cooling in the summertime to antidote the heat of summer. It's a very common, basic Ayurvedic principle. And then w foods in the wintertime when it was cold were more heavy and warmer and, uh, and heavier for us to eat. In fact, the studies show that, which I think is sort of amazing, that we have different digestive enzymes in the fall and the winter than we do in the spring and the summer. Uh, enzymes like amylase. Amylase is an enzyme for digesting starch. And there's a lot of people out there that say starch is actually bad for us, which is sort of funny because um, we evolved about two million years ago to actually create our own enzyme called amylase to digest starch. And generally speaking, you don't create or evolve to, ex to express a gene to manufacture your own enzyme for starch if you weren't eating starch, right? Generally, when you acquire a gene for something, it's because you did it a lot, right? Um, so clearly, we got this. No, there's no debate about the fact we have this enzyme. And guess when this enzyme increases in your body and mine? Every single fall when wheat and grains and nuts and seeds are harvested, which is a really important part of our circadian rhythms is to get those higher dense starchy foods to give us the insulation and the stored energy and the reserve fuel for the winter to come. It's the feast time of the year, time we should be eating a lot and gaining a few pounds and storing fat. It's a very important part of our circadian rhythms and our circadian cycle. But of course, in America today, wheat has become demonized and lectins are poisons and you shouldn't eat any of these foods because they're really, really hard to digest and people feel bad when they eat them. But just because you feel bad when you eat a food doesn't mean the food is bad, right? If you put gas in your car and then your car stalls, do you stop putting gas in your car? Or do you go to the mechanic and say, I put gas in my car, it doesn't run good. So when you put food that you've been eating for three and a half million years, and they found gluten in the teeth of ancient humans three and a half million years ago, by the way. And so we've been eating it for a long time. The grasslands of Africa were covered with wheat and barley, all glutinous grains. And so we did do that for a very, very long time. And I get it that the wheat is somewhat different. It's highly processed, and I'm not talking about that. But, but um, wheat is not the poison that we once that we have been told it is. Lectins are not poisonous. There are studies that show that when people go gluten-free um, and they start taking foods that are harder to digest out of their diet, they end up creating, having a compromised immune system. In other words, these hard to digest lectins, these anti-nutrients on grains and nuts and seeds and beans and legumes, they actually trigger an immune response inside of your intestinal tract, something we evolved for millions of years to eat poisonous foods and figure out a way to handle that and make it work. And when you all of a sudden take all those hard to digest foods out of the diet and sterilize everything, you find yourself without that immune stimulation to trigger gut immunity. And they did studies where people who, I wrote an article, if you want to read it, it's called The Dangers of a Gluten-Free Diet. And what they now know to be true is that people who eat wheat have significantly less, these are two Harvard studies, both over 100,000 people, both over 30 years, that people eat the, the most amount of wheat have significantly less heart disease in one study and significantly less diabetes in another study than the people who are gluten-free. And other studies have found that people who were eating wheat had four times less mercury in their blood than people who were gluten-free. In another study, the people who were eating wheat had significantly more good bacteria in their gut and significantly less bad bacteria in the gut than people who were gluten-free. And finally, the people who were eating the most wheat had significantly more killer T cells, a measure of immune strength, than people who were gluten-free, all of which suggests, wow, that's sort of weird. How come all these people eat wheat are somewhat healthier in so many different ways? And, and the reason is because the natural anti-nutrients provide gut immunity and immune stimulation. And if we take those foods out of the diet because we feel bad eating them, and I get it, if you feel bad eating wheat, I wouldn't suggest to eat it. But I would suggest to find out why I am not able to digest those hard to digest things because your ability to digest those foods is directly linked to your ability to detoxify. And with 400 billion pounds of toxic chemicals in the American environment every single year that's dumped, we have to detoxify well. 
So your digestive strength is linked to your ability to detoxify, which is really, really important. So, so the seasons are sort of really a beautiful thing when you start to begin to look at how we can begin to live in sync with the natural, with the natural cycles. Did this thing not work or did it go off? The cord? It's in there, I think. Oh, put it in and put it out. Oh, there we go. So, so let's just talk about the seasons for a second. And what I want to do is I want to take you through the different times of day, the Ayurveda clock, and go through those um, as well and how important it is. And you should also know that the... Um, the circadian clock is regulated by one molecule, and that molecule is called melatonin. And uh, a lot of folks think that melatonin is just a sleep drug you buy in the grocery store, but it's not. Um, melatonin uh, does put you to sleep, so it can then do its job. It's the oldest molecule on the planet. It's three billion years old. Every living creature, bug, flea, critter, plant, anything that's alive has melatonin in it. It's how we connect to the light-dark cycles. And for billions of years, if you didn't know nighttime was coming or winter was coming, you were sort of in big trouble. And so that is what is, that's what keeps our circadian clock regulated. It's manufactured inside of our gut, but mostly inside of our pineal gland. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to talk about how you clean out your brain lymphatics, which drain three pounds of chemicals and plaque out of your head every year while you sleep at night. And if those brain lymphatics are congested, which is significant, then you end up clogging up your pineal gland, which means you don't make as much melatonin. As you age, nature has a way of getting rid of us anyway. And that is one of the ways to do that is to uh, stop producing melatonin. So there are ways to sort of hack the aging process by taking what's called low-dose melatonin to actually, you know, help keep you somewhat in rhythm. Uh, you know, melatonin is also the only thing the science shows that that um, um, doesn't have what's called an LD50. An LD50 is what's called the lethal dose for 50% of people who take it. So for half the people who take it, they die at a certain dose. There's a lethal dose LD50 for water, for ginger tea, for anything that you would ever ingest. There's studies that show there's an LD50 for it, and they never have been able to find an LD50 for melatonin. It hasn't killed anything ever, um, which is why in America they sell it at such high whopping dosages of 15, 10, 15, 20 milligrams, and we're talking really the low dose and the new research is suggesting to take 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams or even less than that, you can still get the benefit. You can literally put it on your skin. You can put 0.1 milligram on your skin, get 15% less of that, and it still is as effective in the science. And it, in that regard, it encourages the natural production of your own as opposed to overruling your body's own intelligence. So there's ways to use melatonin to reset your natural cycles. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's talk about winter for a second. Winter is a cold and dry season, and nature's response to the cold and dry season is to give us foods that warm us up, right? So the nuts and the seeds and the grains and the, and the, and the legumes and the higher protein diets in the wintertime would be a more appropriate thing to do. This is what we call vata season. Vata is regulated by air. Nature's response to that cold, dry season is to give us the antidote to the extreme of that season with the foods that are naturally harvested. So in nature, the Ayurvedic diets, the Vata Pitta Kapha diets, are really just winter, summer, spring diets that give you antidote foods for the extreme of each season. If your body type was more winter-based and you were a cold or a dry body type and you had tended to be cold all the time and you always needed a blanket, then this would be a, this would be a time of the year where you really need to make sure that you bring the Vata back into balance and it's very, very important. If you, let your, if you let yourself get dry in the winter, right? We all know that we get dry in the winter, isn't that right? Sinuses get dry, intestinals get dry, your joints get dry, the body gets dry. Nature's response is to give us a higher fat diet. If we don't eat that higher fat diet, 
in the wintertime, we end up in a situation where um, the sinuses become dry. The reaction to the dryness of the sinuses is to produce reactive mucus. And the more mucus you make in reaction to the dryness of winter, and if you didn't antidote that with higher fat, higher mucusy, higher, more unctuous, oily, heavier foods, you would, your, your, your sinuses would dry, become irritated, produce reactive mucus, which is a breeding ground for colds and flus and bacteria and viruses, and you get sick in the winter. Your intestinal tract dries out in the winter time. And then comes spring, to the extent that you got dried out in the winter time, is to the extent that you will make reactive mucus um, sorry, I'll go to this one. You'll make reactive mucus in the springtime, which we're in now. The springtime is a really important season because it's nature's new year. There's a massive microbial surge in the ground. All these bugs are being produced and they attach to the roots. And when you pull out those roots or eat those bugs, you're inoculating your gut with this year's microbes to support all types of immunity and mucus protection from the tendency for spring to be a time of year where you increase the amount of uh, mucus that we make. It's a wet, rainy, muddy time of the year, and nature's harvest is the antidote to that, which is leafy greens and sprouts and berries and cherries and things that will help uh, antidote the, the, the tendency to make more mucus. We call it allergy season, and nature's response to that is to is to antidote the mucus-making um, tendency with more dry foods. Every spring, the, 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 the ground softens, and the deer dig up all the bitter roots. And those bitter roots are like dandelion root, and Oregon grape, and golden seal, and burdock. And they're, they're roots that have a lot of alkaloids that clean and scrub your intestinal skin. And they scrub your intestinal tract as step one for nature's cleansing process that takes place. So historically, dandelion root tea was a tea that everybody drank in throughout the world, really, in Europe and here. Everybody drank dandelion root. In France, they had a name for it. It was called pissenlit. And pissenlit means to pee in the bed. Everybody from France knew that if you drank dandelion tea, which everybody does, if you do it before you go to bed, you pee in the bed. So don't drink the tea before you go to bed because you might wet the bed. And back then, I think the desert made it like horse hair, and it was bad, and it wasn't good to pee in the bed. It's not good now, but it was really bad then. And so that's why everybody knew not to drink dandelion tea. Then some Frenchman came over here, and he decided to rename it called Dandelion, the tooth of the lion. And I don't know where he took his botany classes, but they already named it in France. And he was French, so I don't get that. I'm still trying to figure that out. But that means everybody in America was peeing in the bed because they didn't get the name right when they came. So anyway, but dandelion is a high, is a natural diuretic, right? To get rid of all the fluid and it's springtime. It's a rainy, muddy, wet time of the year where the earth is holding on to more water. We hold on to more water. So nature gives us these natural diuretics and dandelion loaded with potassium to, to, to replenish our electrolytes, but at the same time giving us that diuresis that we need every spring. So after you take the dandelion roots in, in, the, in the early part of spring, which you're in now, and you're cleaning and scrubbing your intestinal tract, the second step in nature is all the microgreens, those fluorescent greens that cover the valleys in the spring, right? You've all seen them, right? Those fluorescent greens are so important because they're loaded with antioxidants. They're about 400 times more nutritious nutrients than, than the actual full-grown plant. And they're loaded with chlorophyll, all of which feed the microbiome. So when you're eating these plants, they're loaded with bugs because they got the spring inoculation of all this new spring surge of bugs in the soil. When you eat them, you actually have, you scrubbed your intestinal skin with the uh, with the, uh, the bitter roots, you fertilize them with these fluorescent spring greens. Um, and then the last step in the spring one, two, three punch to get you ready for the new year is the, 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 the leafy greens that start to come out, the berries, the cherries, the antioxidants that take place. There's berries that are harvested in the spring, like strawberries. There's um, the cherries, which are the last kind of berry-ish, sort of half fruit, half berry. They're not really sure what they do. They look like a fruit, but they act like a berry because they're very powerful antioxidants and they scrub when they clean and they scrub your lymphatic system. Tomorrow we'll talk more about the lymphatic system, but it's the number one system we treat in Ayurvedic medicine. 
It's called the Rasa Datu. The study of Rasa is, the, is called Rasayana, and the study of Rasayana is the study of longevity. So very important to understand the lymphatic system. I wrote an entire free ebook on the lymphatic system. If you want to download that and read, learn more about the lymph, it's the most important system in our body. And it's the very first thing that we treat because it's the drainage system. And it starts inside your intestinal tract. And if the lymph that lines your intestinal tract is called the mesentery, which has recently been deemed its own organs, like the 82nd organ in the body, like your liver, your spleen, your lymph is now considered an organ, not just a circulatory system. And that system is so critically important. Um, and it's scrubbed by the berries and the leafy greens and the cherries and spring. So nature takes care of what I call the most important half inch in your body every spring by scrubbing your intestinal villi, by fertilizing them with greens, and then cleansing the lymphatic system that, that drains your whole entire intestinal tract. And if you can get that right every spring, you're set. The rest of it is downhill from there. But that's what happens every spring, why spring is so critically important to get it right. Because, because if we don't get it right, then what happens is we go to summer, and if we don't get all that extra mucus, see, to the extent that you got dried in the winter, you're going to make extra mucus in the spring. And if you have extra mucus in the spring and you don't deal with it, you're going to bake that mucus onto your intestinal tract, and it's become hardened mucoid material in your intestinal tract for the rest of the summer. And then, you're, and then your ability to absorb and detoxify and assimilate nutrition is going to be much more difficult. And if you do that year after year after year after year, you just layer on this hardened mucoid material in your intestinal tract. You wonder why, as you get older, you can't deliver the nutrition. You start to get older and wrinkled and you don't have your joints wear out. You become stiffer and more rigid because you don't have the elasticity in your intestinal skin, which is like the three little bears. It's gotta be just right. Can't be too dry in there, constipated, can't be too wet in there, loose. It's got to be just right for the bugs to function properly. And what we do in Western medicine and even in naturopathic medicine is we clobber the intestinal tract to get it to go. If you're constipated, we give you laxatives and rip your intestinal tracts to shreds. We pour anti-candida agents in there and anti-SIBO agents and we kill it with antibiotics. I mean, that poor intestinal tract which is like the three little bears. It's just trying to be just right. And we keep screwing it up with these extremely aggressive, heavy-handed modalities in the name of trying to get symptomatic relief without actually dealing with the underlying cause. So in the summertime, we have a very hot season. And it's a very important time of the year because the hot season is antidoted by the cooling fruits and vegetables, right? And one thing you should remember in circadian medicine, at the end of every cycle, at the end of every season, you will see an accumulation of the qualities of that cycle. So at the end of summer, when the leaves turn red, there's an accumulation of heat. And nature says, I got this. Don't worry about it. We got this figured out. We're going to give you apples and pomegranates and watermelons and leafy greens and fruits, all of which were super cooling foods. Nature said, I'm going to give you apple trees, which have this like ridiculous amount of apples. Anybody ever figure out why there's so many apples on an apple tree? I mean, you ever, you have anybody have an apple tree in their yard? Have anybody ever eaten any, uh, half of them, a third of them, a quarter of them? I mean, really, what's the point of so many apples? Nature was trying to send us a message. It was like we're talking about last night, like the cat last night. It was a message from God. I think apples are like a message from God. They're saying, hey, you should eat them. Why? Well, because I made a lot of them for you, and be respectful. And number two, they're here at this particular time of the year. And if you go to the northwest or the northeast where they grow apples, everybody walks around with loose bowel movements for the entire month of October. Why? Because apples are loaded with pectin and loaded with fiber, and they're very cooling, and they help you get, they give you looser bowel movements. And looser bowel movements, called purgation in Ayurveda, is how but the body dissipates heat, which is accumulating at the end of every summer. So nature says, don't worry about that heat that accumulated. I get it. You didn't eat enough fruits and vegetables all summer long. I'm going to give you apples and pomegranates to chill it out and cool it out. And we're going to make a little loose stool. It's going to be okay. But that's how we get rid of the excess heat. Because if you don't get rid of that excess heat, then it comes winter, which is really dry. You go from, you get from, from hot and dry in the summer to cold and dry in the winter. And what accumulates is what? dry. 
And most people in the winter get excessively dry. Their joints dry, their bones dry, their, their intestinal tracts dry, their sinuses dry, their skin gets dry. Nature is saying, yeah, I'm giving you nuts and seeds, but they're not eating them. And we accumulate that dryness. And once again, to the extent you got dry in the winter, is the extent you get mucus in the spring, and then you get the mucus in the spring, and you don't eat the cool, the, the cleansing, mucus-reducing foods in the spring. You don't do the one, two, three punch I just told you to do. You go into the winter, summertime, and now you bake all that hard, that mucus on your intestinal tract. It layers it. You can't digest much of anything. The heat accumulates. At the end of summer, you didn't do the apples again. And now we have no purgation, and we can't get rid of the heat, and you do 10, 20, 30 years of that, and my goodness gracious, it's not pretty. <laughs> but that's why babies, when they get a fever, what else do they get when they get a fever? Diarrhea, right? We shouldn't say it's like, it sounds gross, but that's what happens. The body gets rid of that heat in, in, when you get a fever by loosening up the stool. That's the way we do it. So nature had this beautiful circadian thing happening that we do really have no idea about. But we start to live in sync with that and start eating seasonal foods and understanding how to eat more of what's in season. It doesn't mean you have to only eat seasonal foods, but you want to think about getting medicinal dosage of those foods in season to get the right foods at the right time of the year to give you the right medicinal benefit to get you back in sync with your circadian clock so you stay in rhythm and you change those gut bugs. Otherwise, bad things happen inside your intestinal tract. That makes sense? Yes. So that's um, the seasonal clock, right? You don't want to be in the springtime right now, which is a mucus-making season. Eating mucus-making foods which is pastas and breads and things like that, because there is no bread harvested in the spring, right? Last time I checked, right? So if you're a mucus-making person, a kapha body type, in the mucus-making season of spring, which you're in right now, eating mucus-making foods, God forbid you're a child in the mucus-making time of their life, what you're doing is you're stacking a bunch of mucus, and you wonder why your kids get congested and colds and ear tubes and all these asthma breathing difficulties, right? Because we just stacked a bunch of mucus. Nature's like, God, I don't know why they got that idea, but I don't, I don't harvest any of that stuff in the spring. And if we would just eat more of what's in season, you would actually automatically antidote the extreme of each season. We, we'd move through these cycles effortlessly and gracefully and healthfully, right? Super simple, super easy. And then comes the, the, uh, the daily clock. Um, so let's look at this clock here for a second. At 6 o'clock in the morning, let's call it sunrise. And let's call it 6 o'clock, again, sunset. Okay, it's two 12-hour cycles. Okay? So um, here's what we know. That between 6 o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock in the morning, kapha. Every cycle starts with kapha. Every star cycle starts with spring. So this is the spring time of the day. Spring is kapha, kapha is heavy, it's earthy, it's watery, and the longer you lie in bed, generally the heavier and stiffer and more tired you get. Like if you have teenagers, they're really good at that. They, they, the longer they lie there, the, the longer they can lie there. And, when they, and the longer they lie there, the more tired they get up. They don't wake up refreshed, right? Is that true? Yeah. So, so, um, so what should we be doing at this time of, the, uh, time of the day? The studies show that the muscles are stronger to do plow fields and, 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 and dig ditches. That's what I do. I get my kids up at 4.30 in the morning. We have them dig ditches every morning because it's part of the cycle, right? Because I want to keep them in rhythm. And... Uh, and after they dig their ditches, we come in and we feed them breakfast, but a seasonal breakfast, one like some berries and maybe some sprouts and leafy greens. And that's why they're so healthy and so wonderful. My boys are still there at home, plowing the fields every morning. <laughs> when we're here, I'm sure every morning they're up at 4.30 plowing and doing all those things that boys do. Um, so. So this is the time that the study showed the muscles are stronger. When I did a, a seminar years ago in the Soviet Union, and they told me they do, that all, they do all their power lifting first thing in the morning when the muscles are actually proven to be stronger. So this is the time we should be doing more physical activity. And then we move into the pitta time of the day here where the digestive system is, is stronger. And this is maybe the most important time of the day because um, studies show that if we eat a, a breakfast and a lunch, 
versus a lunch and a supper that the people who eat a breakfast and lunch have significantly uh, more weight loss, uh, lower blood pressure, lower risk of cardiovascular disease. There's a host of science that suggests that we, that our circadian rhythms like us to have a breakfast and a lunch versus a lunch and a supper, eating the same amount of calories. Um, many people have been told also that, that we should be eating uh, little meals throughout the day. Uh, a lot of folks who can't eat a big meal because if they do, they fall asleep. How many of you, if you eat a big meal at lunchtime, you fall asleep and you feel like you can't really do it that well? So we find ourselves um, having a small salad uh, at this time of the day. And the studies show that if you eat a, 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 a meal here, the reason for the meal here is to support the brain here. The afternoon between 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 is when the vata, the nervous system, becomes active. So I think the most important question when I teach some of that, the Ayurveda colleges, I tell them the most important question you can ask your patients is, how do you feel between 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 o'clock in the afternoon? And most people feel, well, you know, it's not my best time. Uh, I mean, tired, um, nibbling on chocolate, I'm craving Starbucks. Uh, I find myself, you know, really having a lull during that time. And this is the time of day where the brain is craving 80% of the blood sugar at this point in time. And if you didn't stop and take time and have a relaxing meal here, and you go into this time with no gas in your tank, you're going to crash and burn. So it's very important for you to ask yourself, how do you feel here? You know, I, I, I tell my students that I spent the first 20 years of my practice helping people figure out how to regulate these two cycles right here. This is the, where the rubber meets the road. If this is not happy, you're gonna pay a price because if you don't have a big tank of gas here and you go into the afternoon here crashing and burning, how many of you feel a little lull, crave this or that at the afternoon, you wanna take a little bit of a nap? That means that your blood sugar is crashing, which means your body's responding to that day as a life-threatening, disease-producing, lymphatic, congesting emergency, which means that your body has to adapt to that emergency stress and a lot of times the brain, like we talked about last night, will pull down the menu and go, how do, I get, how do I get out of that hole? And it might be dark chocolate, it might be a chip or two or three, or maybe it's um, coffee or a stimulant or a Red Bull or a nap or something. And then you inject yourself to feel better. And then that injection gives you a little bit of energy. And then of course it sort of crashes you back down and then you feel a lull and then you need another injection to feel better. And then you crash and then you feel another injection. And most people, a lot of people spend most of their time on the way to feeling good and therefore on the way to feeling bad and then on the way to feeling good again, on the way to feeling bad. And they only feel good for a very short periods of time during their day because they're living on this high, low roller coaster ride. Where, and that means that you flipped your body into becoming a sugar burner, a carbohydrate burner, as opposed to fat burner. And how you, how you force the body to burn fat is really very simple. You give the body reasons to burn fat. If you give it a breakfast, and then a snack, and then a lunch, and a snack, and then a, and a supper, and then a snack, and then bed, you're gonna burn the, the meal and the snack, and the meal and the snack, and the meal and the snack, and throughout the day, you're just gonna eat off the buffet and eat the meal and the snack, and that's what you're gonna do all day long. Why in the world would you ever burn some of your stored fat when you're being fed a meal and a snack and a meal and a snack throughout the day? Does that make sense? So if you wanna burn fat, it's really simple. Give the body a, a longer trip so if you have breakfast and nothing till lunch, you'll burn fat. If you have breakfast and a, a handful of nuts and then lunch, you're going to burn the nuts. Not bad. Nuts are good. But you didn't burn your fat that day. If you have a nice, big, relaxing lunch and then have nothing till supper, you're going to burn your fat between lunch and supper. You have an apple, you're going to burn the apple that day. It's not bad. It's just that you burn the apple instead of your fat. If you fast from from supper all the way till breakfast, you have a nice long fast, you break the fast with, with breakfast. Studies show that humans are supposed to burn nothing but fat all day long, but studies show that most humans never go into fat burning throughout the night. They're constantly burning their sugar. When they run out of sugar, they crash and burn and they wake up. The number two reason why people can't sleep at night is because their blood sugar is crashing. Why? We've been giving you a meal and a snack and a meal and a snack and a meal and a snack. You're like a baby. You have a two-hour feeding schedule. Then you say, now I'm going to go to bed and sleep for eight hours. And I'm supposed to sleep. And the body goes, how are you going to sleep for eight hours? Because we get fed every two hours. 
Like, what's up with that? Like, what do you think's going to happen here? I'm going to go to sleep and sleep for eight hours when I'm used to getting fed every two? It doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense. And people wake up because they have a blood sugar crashing experience in the middle of the night. They wake up. Sometimes they're hungry. Sometimes they're not. But that's one of the major reasons why they wake up. The number one reason why people can't sleep at night is because they have no energy. They have no energy that you need to give yourself the ability to sedate yourself so you can go to sleep and stay asleep throughout the night. And one of the reasons why people have no energy is because they're on the roller coaster ride going crashing, stimulating up and crashing down, stimulating up and crashing down, and bad things happen. When I was 27 years old, I went for my first Ayurveda consultation uh, to do Panchakarma, and the doctor looked at me, and, he, and uh, well, the nurse took my blood pressure, and it was like 135 over 95. And I was meditating, I was an athlete, supposedly, and I was healthy, I thought. And I had a blood pressure that was 135 over 95. And I was like, and they said, John, you've got high blood pressure. I said, that's impossible. And I, and I had them take it on this side and this side. I was in major denial. The doctor came in, he looked at me, and he said, what do you eat for lunch? And I said, I have a, this is my first year in practice. And they said, he, and I said, I have a really busy practice. And I eat a big breakfast. And I eat a big supper. But I'm usually running late. And I have a little grab something on the run for lunch. And, um, and I remember I said, I feel like I'm hit, at the end of my day, I'm so wasted. I'm so exhausted. I feel like I was hit by a bus by five o'clock. Anybody ever feel that? Like at the end of the day, you feel like you were just hit by a bus or a truck or a moped or something. You just feel like you're so exhausted. And I was 27. I'm going, this is like what I worked for. I'm like, this is crazy. And I, I said, I can't spend the rest of my life like this because it was just bad. It was a bad feeling. And the doctor looked at me and he said, um, go home, have a nice warm cooked meal in the middle of the day. You'll never have high blood pressure again. I was like, come on, really? Give me one of those little pills that you have, the Ayurvedic pills, and I'll pop it and we'll be fine. We'll get this thing taken care of. And he goes, you don't need any pills. You need to stop in the middle of the day, take a relaxing meal, and um, therefore digest here better. So I had a full tank of gas here when my brain was saying I need 80% of my blood sugar, which I didn't have because I was not eating anything but a couple like chocolate truffles to get through the afternoon, which got me into like about 1.30 and then boom, I was crashing for the rest of the day. And I had no gas in my tank and when I crashed, my emergency fight or flight alarm bells went off and however you're genetically predisposed to break down, if you do that, you're going to break down. And for me, it was blood pressure and my hair fell out. Um, so both of those things can happen, so that might scare you. Um, um, but anyway, so I actually started listening to that. I started telling my patients to do that, finally got myself to do that. Because I was sort of experimenting with it, you know, because I was like, wow, that's such a cool thing. And could it be real? And anyway, my blood pressure now is actually low. I have to remember to take salt because if I, because when you eat a really healthy, clean, whole food, non-processed food diet, you run the risk of not getting a lot of salt. Because the reason why salt's a big thing in America, like salt's such a poison, because it's loaded in all the processed foods. If you start eating non-processed foods, you don't get any salt. If you look at like the amount of salt in an almond, it's like 400 grams of potassium to three grams of sodium. Everything from nature is low sodium, high potassium. So salt is something that you could actually not get enough of. So I actually have to remember to eat salt now. Other my blood pressure goes down to like, you know, 90 over 60. Um, so I have low blood pressure now, completely opposite by living in sync. And I think that's such a beautiful thing that we can do. We can reverse a predisposition to certain conditions by getting ourselves back into rhythm. And that's what I was gifted by that and, and spent, like I said, the first 20 years of my practice helping people stop, take time, relax, and have a nice big meal in the middle of the day. And when you think about those three factors to eating, there's the how and the when and the what you eat. If you think about what's the most important piece of that puzzle, of course, what you eat, seasonal food, makes really good sense. Of course, when you eat the food, the middle of the day, big time important circadian clock rhythms. We know there's good science to back it up. But if I had to choose which one of those is the most important, it's the how you eat. How you eat is so critically important because it's basic physiology. 
If you're eating on the run, standing up, there's an old Ayurvedic saying that says, death looks over your shoulder. When you're eating stressed out, your fight or flight nervous system activates and engages. And when you're relaxed and calm, your parasympathetic nervous system engages. Your parasympathetic turns on your digestive ability. Your fight or flight system literally turns it off. So if you're eating your car, driving, on the run, gobbling here, going here, eating on the run fast, you're literally turning off your digestion. So you wonder why I have indigestion, why I can't digest. Ayurveda calls it upward moving digestion. Everything goes up instead of down. It creates indigestion. And one of the most important pieces of the puzzle is to take time and relax and eat your food. I remember when I was in India one time, I was eating a, food, a meal with a, a, West, a medical doctor there. And, um, and his, his family made this really beautiful spread. It was in South India and it was on banana leaves. It was really beautiful. And the mom was like serving us and coming up and coming down and serving us with this beautiful meal. And I was like, Can you, I would really, could you maybe like sit with us and enjoy? I felt so bad that she was having to just get up and down and serve us the entire time and not actually sit with us or eat with us or join us for the meal. And I was in that well, it was sort of one of those like frustrated Indian kind of kind of man chauvinistic cultures that treat women poorly. And I was just having sort of unstressing over this whole thing. And finally, I got up and I I went through to the to the kitchen because she wouldn't sit with us at all. She was sort of like, "There's no way that's happening." As I asked her to do that, and I went through the kitchen to play with the kids, her kids in the backyard. And as I went through the kitchen after dinner, she was sitting there at a beautiful table in the kitchen with flowers by herself, having her meal at peace. And I was like, oh my God, that's what this is about. Whoever serves the food is not gonna actually be able to be relaxed and take time and enjoy their food, right? Whoever serves the meal um, is gonna have to be up and down and if they're eating on the way, it would be terrible for them and they would never risk the, the importance of taking time and relaxing, having good digestion and having a real satisfying meal to serve them and eat at the same time. It would be like disrespectful to ask her to do that, right? And so it was so important for, for, the, for somebody who was serving to actually have time to eat on their own, which I thought was really beautiful. But then I went right back into my like, why aren't the men serving us? And why do the women have to be the ones sitting in the room by themselves eating? And anyway, it's still screwed up. But the point is that, that if, if that is really a critical piece of the culture to take time and relax and eat your food. And that's why they eat with their hands, right? They eat in their India, what they eat with their hands. And it's a really important thing because when you're eating with your hands, you can't like open a magazine. You can't flip the clicker on the TV set. You can't open, you can't open your phone and text anything. You're sort of stuck with all this food in your hands. So it's really important. So I was in India, and I was studying in India for about a year and a half, and my teacher, um, this is like six, seven, eight months with my teacher. I, I went to India for a three-week vacation in 1986, came back a year and a half later. Um, I closed my practice by a scratchy phone from New Delhi, and that's how I started my Ayurvedic career many, many years ago. And uh, so I'm with my teacher, and he looks at me, and I'm eating, and you have the white dhoti, kurta, and all that on, and, and I was really bad at eating, so I'm eating the food, and you're eating dal, and it's like soup, right? And they're like, boom, and they do it really fast, and it's like, boom, 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 they do it so fast, they don't want you to see what's really happening. And, so after six months of this, my, he goes to me, he goes, what, I'm going like trying to do what they do, right? It's like all over me every day. I got a new thing. And in India, getting a new, like getting clean clothes is like a pain, right? It's a pain in an ashram to do that. So I said, so he goes, what are you doing? So what? Well, I'm eating. Why? And he goes, he goes, you don't know the flick? I said, what? He goes, the flick. I go, the flick? I'm going like, what? There's a flick? What? There's a technique involved in this? And he goes, yeah, it's a flick. You don't do the flick? I'm going like, I've been with you for nine months. I've been pouring food on me for every day, every single day. And now, after this, you tell me there's a flick involved? And he goes, oh, yes, it's a flick. I said, are you kidding me? I'm like, okay, what's the flick? All right, I'm going to tell you this right now, and, I'm, and, and I, I swear you're going to thank me for the rest of your life. This is maybe the most important thing I teach you all weekend. So when you take the food, right, you take it in your hand, you have to put your thumb back here like that, and you've got to flick it in. <laughs> you didn't know that. Are you just learning that now? Oh, yeah, see? I'm helping you guys out so much, you have no idea. 
Because if you don't go like that, you have to sort of stuff it in. And if it's rice and soupy dal, that's really just not, I mean, this is not pretty. So, flicking it. So then I came back, I was super excited, I taught my kids about the flick, and they were super excited about learning the flick, and we went to an Italian restaurant, and you have a bunch, of, you have six kids, right? <laughs> when you have six kids, you go to a restaurant, half the time you're in the bathroom, because they go in one at a time. They never go to the bathroom at the same time, they all have to go individually, right? So you, so you half the time you're spending in the bathroom. I walk out of the bathroom, and they're eating, they're flicking the spaghetti, you know, because I just taught them the flick. I'm like, you guys, man, this is not flicking food. Definitely not. Anyway, um, so there you have it. This is the best time of day to flick. <laughs> Don't forget that. Um, then we have the afternoon, and then nighttime comes, right? Nighttime comes. We should be going to bed now, soon. We have 20 minutes before 10 o'clock, before we lose our ability to go to sleep. Melatonin kicks into your body as soon as the sun sets which is trying to get you to sleep so then the janitors and the night watchmen and the detoxifiers can come and clean and rebuild and rejuvenate you. Melatonin is doing its job while you sleep, but many of us, the sun sets at 6 o'clock and the lights don't go out until 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock and we lose 5, 6, 7 hours of melatonin every single night. That completely disturbs our circadian rhythms. It's so critically important. The liver is activated. The glutathione in the liver is driven by melatonin. Melatonin drives the production of your detoxifying hormones at night between 10 o'clock and 2. 10 o'clock and 2 is so critically important because that's the time the liver detoxifies you. Studies show that people who take chemotherapy drugs at night have 40% less detoxification toxicity reactions when they do it at night versus taking that toxic drug first thing in the morning. Studies show that when people take aspirin and they take it at nighttime, it significantly lowers their blood pressure because the liver detoxifies the chemicals and delivers them into the bloodstream more efficiently versus if they take that same aspirin in the morning, there's no blood pressure lowering effect. Tylenol toxicity, which is a big thing, there's like 78,000 cases of that per, per year. When they have people who take the Tylenol at night, they have significantly less toxicity issues at this time of night than when they take the Tylenol first thing in the morning. So studies show now circadian medicine, the Western version of circadian medicine is now one of their really exciting things is that they're going to tell you when to take the drug to have the least amount of side effect. Um, which is at least one good thing, right? I mean, it is one good thing to understand. But this is the time of night that we should be sleeping so we can begin engage in our natural detoxification and wake up sometime before the sun rises, before the kapha time of day, which obviously really does happen here, which is really, really important. So think about this for a second. If you went to bed tonight at midnight, which I know you're not going to do, but if you did and you woke up tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, how would you feel? Like maybe like a little heavy or a little stiff, like you slept too long, something like that. Would that make sense? But let's say you went to bed the next night at 8 o'clock and you woke up at 6 o'clock. How would you feel in comparison, better or worse? Much better, right? Well, what was the difference between those two nights of sleep? They were both 10 hours of sleep. You got the exact same amount of sleep, but you got them at different circadian times. When I first came back from India, I met Deepak Chopra in India and I started traveling around teaching with him and doing workshops with him and doing Ayurvedic consultations uh, while I was with him. And, um, and um, I had a patient, he was in Washington, D.C. and he had headaches every morning when he'd wake up and every four months I'd go back to that same center and do his Ayurveda, do his pulse and take his pulse and tell him what I do to give him some therapies. And I went there once, came back the next time, it didn't work. And the third time I came back, I looked, I said to him, I said, because it wasn't any better, I said, what time do you go to bed? And he said, like, two or three. I said, what time do you wake up? And he said, around 11 or 12. And I said, can you do me a favor? Can you take out a boring book at around 8.30? Don't take my book out, because you'll be up all night. I said, take a boring book out, some boring old book, like an encyclopedia or something, and start reading it around 8.30, and by 9.30, when your eyes started to get a little heavy, shut the book, go to sleep. And then when your eyes open at like 5.05 or 
506 or whatever it is that your eyes open up in the morning, just get out of bed. I don't care if you're sleepy or tired, just get up and start walking around. I don't care if you bump into stuff, just start walking around, do not go back to sleep. He called me up two weeks later and he said, John, this is the first time in years that I slept through the night and I woke up without a headache. Thank you so much. But then he proceeded to yell at me for not telling him to do that the very first day. Um, and the organization I was with only let me do 10 minute consultations, so I didn't have a lot of time to do a lot of history taking, but, but the power of circadian medicine is really, really powerful. Eating at the right time, sleeping at the right time, living in sync with the natural cycles, eating in season is so important, and I just don't get it. Like, I feel like I'm beating my head against her, and now we have this ketogenic diet, 80% fat in your diet. And the only culture that does that is the, the Inuits. And there's like significant issues with their health and longevity. And I just don't understand it. They actually acquired a gene, the Inuits did, to not be in long-term ketogenesis. So, but you know what I mean? Like I'm just so confused by the science that we're gonna talk tomorrow morning a lot about the dietary science and the confusing uh, dietary trends that, that, have that are here today. And I've done a lot of interviews with some of the dietary experts that I want to share with you tomorrow and see if we can make some sense about diets and find some logic and some seasonal understanding of how we should eat. Um, and, um, but from tonight's perspective, as step two in our journey here for sort of the Kaya Kalpa to really live the longest, healthiest life we can live, it's living in sync, going downstream with the current. And when you're going downstream, uh, you know, life is easy. So we'll see you tomorrow morning. We'll talk more about this. Thanks very much.